Good morning. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you. This is Ascension Day. We're recording on Thursday, Ascension Day, where our Lord went up to the heavens to represent us before God. And it's really an honor and a privilege to be with you guys this morning. Well, Johnny and I are going to try and do this sermon. And he said he'll, he'll try and be quiet. But if you guys hear him in the background, it's, it's children and children are so welcome in the house of God. Look at this church. It's amazing. It's just, you can sit out here all day. And it, it's as if your soul gets rejuvenated out here. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here today. Um, I've got one of my good friends here. I'll stand with him for a while. Um, Scottish, Scottish blood standing with me today. Helping me do the video, and it's really, it's so nice to be able to be here. And Johnny, ons gaan nou weer, jy gaan papa toe, ne? Okay. Thank you, Johnny. So as I said, said it was, it is Ascension Day, Thursday's Ascension Day. It's the day that Jesus ascended up to the heavens. Do you know now Jesus sits above every single thing in this world? Above your problems, above your needs. And out of that position, he can supply answers for you. He can supply to your needs. And it doesn't matter where you are. And today I want to have a look at, normally Ascension Day, we'd go straight into Acts and, and, and read about Jesus ascending so that we can carry the good news of a risen Christ ascending to heaven further. But today I want to go back a little bit and look at a place in history where Jesus was above a lot of things. Jesus had just fed 5,000 people and now he's speaking to his disciples just after feeding 5,000 people. And before feeding 5,000 people, his cousin, whom he had a connection with since before birth, is executed. So you can imagine what is going on in the mind of Jesus. But anyway, so Jesus feeds 5,000 people and then we carry on reading in Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside, and we're on a mountain today, by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance uh, from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake when the disciples saw him walking on the on the lake they were terrified it is a ghost they cried out but Jesus immediately said to them take courage it is I do not be afraid Lord if it is you if it is you Peter replied tell me to come and I will come come he said then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came towards Jesus but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You are of little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Today I want to bring you a message and the title of this message is You Will Not Go Under. With Jesus on your side, you will not go under and you will not fail. You see, Jesus puts the disciples in the boat and when we read it, the King James Version of it, it says Jesus constrained these disciples, almost forced them into the boat. The dictionary uh, explanation of constrained is appearing force and over-controlled. So in essence, Jesus actually put these guys in the storm. Jesus put them in a terrifying place. And so often when we face these challenges in our lives, we often say, the devil is so lustig. That's what we say in Douglas. But you know, sometimes is Jesus causes the storm in your life. Sometimes in hard times, he causes it. And you'll see what is remarkable about going through hard times in your life is God calls together people in your boat, people with a similar mind that are heading in the same direction to surround you and to keep you positive. 
The disciples were locked in the boat together, but they had the same destination. Jesus said to them, go to the other side. You see, Jesus sometimes challenges us to build our faith, not to crush our faith. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tested. And after 40 days, He exited the wilderness. But what's remarkable is, after the suffering in the wilderness, which is 40 days, it's more than a month, that is long. That is a long suffering. He walks out, and when you read what happens in His ministry, He walks into a powerful ministry, a ministry full of healing signs and wonders after his challenges. So I want to bring you this. This is such a special verse. In, it's actually two verses in the New Testament. Galatians 9 and 10. Let us not become weary of doing good, but at the proper time, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And I know when you're in that boat, sometimes it feels like it's been a long journey. Your hands are full of blisters at the oars and you just cannot take another stroke. But watch this. Jesus comes in the fourth hour. That is the last watch of the night. When it is almost too late, Jesus reaches in on the fourth watch. Isn't it funny that when we go through things like it, my mother and racket nach om you. Al skyn die son soos dat hy vandag skyn, jy sien nie 'n toekomsie, dan raak het nag. Dit as asof die wêreld inkrimp en dis donker om you. And when we persevere through this challenges in our in our lives, our faith grows. You see, Faith is an endurance thing. It's not volume driven, it is endurance driven. If you can hold on just another day for a better day, take one more day in faith, stay in the boat. You see, this is the thing. I think the disciples that stayed in the boat had more faith than Peter that walked on the water. Because Jesus said to them, get in the boat and go to the other side. So they knew, even though they had fear, they would get to the other side. Jesus speaks into your life today and he says, you will make it. You will make it because I am on your side. You see, Jesus says to the disciples, go, and they go. He says to Peter, come, and he comes. There's none of this, we're waiting for a confirmation. They hear the word and they act on the word. And when Jesus gets into the boat, and they recognize him and they start praising God, their life changes and the Lord saves them. You see, we've all heard fantastic sermons and pretty much what I've preached up to now, you've most likely heard before. But now I want to take you to the importance of the other, place, other side. You see, sometimes when the winds come up and buffet us, we feel that it is a sign to turn around and head back. But my friends, sometimes it is the wind buffeting you that is assuring you that there is great works on the other side of the lake that we need to force through and get to the other side. Because when they got to the other side, we read that the people surrounded him, surrounded Jesus, and they begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And those who touched it were healed. And this healing part is fantastic because what we read in the King James Version is, um, as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Not just healed. Their family situation, their life situation, their health, yes. But they were made perfectly whole when they touched his garment. You know, if I was a Jew boy in those days, I would have made, I would have made garments. Because the Jews are crazy about garments. It's just, I think it would be the business to be in. Remember Joseph, remember Elijah, remember Elisha, remember King Saul. All carrying on about their garments. And you can read about the importance of the garment, and more specifically the hem of the garment. The hem of the garment represented the relationship of the owner of the garment and God. That was what it represented. And we can see this in when we read 1 Samuel 15. Um, 
Saul. Remember King Saul was out there and he was defeating the world. And Samuel sends him out on another mission. But the commandment was to destroy all. all. And Saul decides to keep back some of the best animals, the best sheep. Samuel confronts Saul and says, What is it that I hear bleating? The sheep. What have you done? And they get into a little bit of a tussle. You should go and read this. 1 Samuel 15. And the king Saul rips the corner of the prophet's cloak. And the prophet turns around and he says, Just as you have ripped this, God is going to rip the kingdom of God out of your hands. And then we go on when we read 1 Samuel 24. Is Saul is hunting down David and Saul decides he needs to leave the room. He needs to go to the bathroom, gets into a cave. And David has an opportunity to kill the king. But what does he do? He cuts off the corner of the king's robe. You see the significance of a robe. Remember the woman that had bleeding? She touched the hem of the garment that Jesus was wearing and she was healed. So the garment... And more specifically, the hem of the garment represents the connection that the owner of the garment has with God. Now, the relationship between Jesus and God is so pure. No sin between them, no issues between them, that when you grab hold of the garment of Jesus, the hem of the garment, that is the new covenant that we stand in. When you grab hold of the new covenant, the power of the garment, the power of the relationship, the power of the new covenant through Jesus flows into you. And you are made perfectly whole through Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? That is what the mission was about. Healing people through Jesus. But how could it be, you know, I thought of bringing a few water skis around. How could it be that someone walks on water? How could it be? You see, we have to understand, what was the mass of water called that Jesus was walking upon? What was it called? It was called the Sea of Galilee. Not a lake. You must go and read it. The Sea of Galilee. Salt water. The sea. Now I want to tell you something today that you might not know. Do you know that in the heaven where God is and where Jesus has ascended to now, there is no sea? Go and read it. Revelations 20, uh, 21 verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the first heaven and the first earth were, were passed away. And there was no sea. How can that be? Why should there be no sea? We all go from the northern Cape. We go to the sea. And now all of a sudden the sea is taken away from us. But what is the significance of this? Do you remember that in this world, God used the sea many times to bring judgment upon people. Do you remember Noah? Where God brought judgment not just on people, but on all the animals of this earth. He judged them. Remember the judgment that God brought at the Red Sea crossing upon the Egyptian army. He judged them through the sea. Remember Jonah that was running away from God thrown into the judgment of God, and then the storm calmed down. Do you remember, and those are all Old Testament, but do you remember when Jesus met up with this guy that was demon-possessed, and he drove out the legion of demons, and the demon said, just don't drive us into the abyss. So Jesus said, well, go into the swines, into the pigs, in Mark 5. Do you remember how God used the sea to judge the pigs? Because they ran off into a cliff, and they all drowned. You see, this is what is so remarkable about the scripture. It's so deep. But Jesus is above the judgment of God because of his purity. And as soon as you touch Jesus today, as soon as you shout, Jesus, I cannot anymore save me today. He stretches out his powerful godly hand, not his baby hand, his powerful godly hand and he grabs you out of the drowning situation. And now when you touch his cloak, when you touch his hand, you touch the, re the, the relationship between Jesus and his dad. And now not because of your doings or undoings, you become child of God. 
Ek gee nie om wat jy gedoen het, wat jy gaan doen nie, maar zodra je grijpt in Jezus' hand, dan gaan die kracht van Jezus dier jou vloei. The purity flows through the grip on his hand, and he will never let you go, my friends. I have experienced this in my life. He will never let you go. As soon as you are in the proximity of Jesus, he will never let you go. He will put you back in your boat, and he will hold you with the power of God in those awesome hands that have got holes in them for you. And now you rise above the judgment of God. It's amazing. So today I want to encourage you, stay close to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus Christ. Hold on to the Him that is the new covenant between Him and God, bought by His blood for us, so that we can also settle down as sons and daughters of God. Jesus did it all for us. That is why today He is seated. No high priest ever sat down in the most holy, excepting Jesus. You can only sit down when you've completed your work. Jesus is Lord forever and ever. Amen. I want to pray for you guys this morning, and I truly hope that you have a blessed day through this word this morning. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Father, thank you that you ascended to heaven, that you sit on the right hand of God, and that you intercede for every single one of us, Father. Father, we know there are people out there in the world that think they do everything right, the self-righteous. We know, Father, that we are not righteous outside of Jesus, that we are mere sinners without Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you consider us worthy to bleed out every drop of blood, that you excuse us from our iniquities and our sins, and that you buy us into a holy priesthood. Thank you, Father, that you use no goods like me in this world to proclaim your word through the power of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you consider every single one of us specially designed by the Creator of heaven and earth. Father, bless this day. Bless every single person that is going through drowning situations, Father, Reach into their lives, Father, as you do with many times, many people many times, so that we can walk on the water with you, so that we can build your kingdom in Douglas, in the Northern Cape, in South Africa, and abroad. Thank you, Father, that we can pray for every single church, that you, Father, call people to churches and fill them before you fill our little church in Douglas. Fill them and keep every pastor and pastor and domini anchored on the love of Christ. No more condemnation for those who stand in Jesus Christ. No more judgment for us, because all our judgment is taken by the Son of God. Thank you, God, for doing this mighty works. We want to praise you today, Father, a holy day, a Sunday which you have made for us to regroup and rest. Thank you, Father, that you give us rest before work, that you are the King of kings. We praise your name and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My dear friends, um, it has really been an honor to bring you this word today. It is really an honor to serve God. Now our prayer for you is that you guys keep safe. Keep safe. Spend time in prayer, meditating on the word. Be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ until we see you again. We love you and we miss you. Amen.